Welcome to Metaphysical Milkshake, the show where we go deep, we get weird, and we search for the meaning of life along the way. Presented by Luminary Media and Soul Pancake. Hi, I'm Reza Aslan. And I'm Rain Wilson, and I am running for president. No, you're not. No, I am not. But we are talking today to someone who is. Oh, my. Did you invite Donald Trump? No. You mother No, no, no. Oh. You know what? Probably the opposite of Donald Trump. Oh, a smart person. So, Reza, you know me. I generally stay out of politics. Yeah, me too. Totally. Oh, that is the biggest pile of (laughs) bull hooky I've ever heard in my life. But I, you know, I don't, I don't really comment on it on social media. You know, I have certainly have my opinions, but I just, I, I feel like the system is so broken. I, I can't even like, I can't even go there. But I really am so excited about today's guest because it is, it's so relevant to what we're doing at Metaphysical Milkshake. Uh, Marianne Williamson, for lack of a better term, new age author and guru and spiritual guide is running for president. And uh, what better conversation could we possibly have? Yeah, listen, you've been talking about Marianne for a while now. I got to be honest. Yes. I've I've been been fighting to get her. You have been. Yeah. yeah, Look, I think that she's gotten a lot of shit uh, because she wants to integrate spirituality in politics. And so people are like, well, then she's obviously a kook. I mean, well, you know, how could how could politics and spirituality possibly have anything to do with each other? But but the truth of the matter is that, you know, we are spiritual people. And if the entire point of democracy is to bring yourself into the political system, to bring your values and ideas into the marketplace of ideas and have other people judge them, uh, whether they are effective or not, well, then why wouldn't spirituality be part of that? My, my friend Omid Safi wrote this incredible essay for uh, some other podcast called On Being. I- I've heard of it. Have you ever heard of it? Yeah, it yeah, like... yeah, vaguely. <clears throat> I think they talk about stuff. Anyway, and he said something that I find to be so spot on. He said, quote, the spiritual is about the social. The mystical is also about the political. This idea that these are separate things has never really made much sense to me, right? Yeah. That's really only been in the last couple of decades. And I will say that I've been a big Marianne Williamson fan for a long time. I used to jog listening to her podcasts for Oprah. I think she's got a tremendous amount of wisdom. I've been very inspired by by her stuff. I'm not I'm not a new agey kind of guy at all. Um, but I also find like a lot of her spiritual ideas and principles really practical and This is a woman, too, who, you know, in the 80s was an anti-AIDS crusader. I mean, she co-founded Project Angel Food, which is a huge nonprofit that feeds and clothes and takes care of and transports uh, people dealing with and suffering with AIDS and HIV. I mean, she puts her money where her mouth is. This is not some, like, you know, crystal-gazing kind of incense-burning person who's like separate from the world. Yeah. Lover or hater, you got to take her seriously. So uh, let's hear from her. She's the author of 13 books, including her most recent book, A Politics of Love, a handbook for a new American revolution. She is, of course, a 2020 uh, Democratic presidential candidate. And what we wanted to talk to her about is this idea of integrative politics, the notion of politics and spirituality, you know, can they be integrated? Uh, Can you have love as a spiritual platform? How does that work? Yeah. And then more personally, why is she such a lightning rod? So let's get into it. I'm Mary Ann Williamson. I'm a, um, an American woman, mother, author, activist, and now candidate for the Democratic nomination for the presidency. I love that you began by first describing yourself as American. And and I'm curious what that actually means for you, because a lot of people um, in your line of work tend to not focus on nationalism, right? They, they think that, you know, well, humanity is all about not being defined by borders or, or, or race or, you know, any kind of label. But the first words out of your mouth was, I'm American. 
Well, to say that I'm an American is not nationalism. Mm. Nationalism is a bad thing, obviously, and it's a, it's a suggestion of, of a national superiority and even worse. I didn't mean anything along that line at all. Why point out I'm a woman? Why point out I'm a mother? Why point out that I'm anything? In fact, I think it's interesting these days, as much discussion as there is of tribal identity, and by tribal identity here, I mean in a positive sense even, whether it's LBGTQ+, plus, whether it's black, whether it's anything else, we all shy away from the American thing mm. because there's so much ambivalence about it, I think. And I think that the only way to claim... The best about America is if we do have a more honest conversation about the shadows, about the worst, about the juxtaposition of elements of darkness and light that are staring us in the face at this time. So, yes, I'm both proud of being an American and very concerned about America and uh, holding those two as both true and having a deep and real honest conversation about that is central to my campaign. Mm -hmm. So I'm fascinated by the fact that I've listened to so many of your podcasts in the, in the past. I've seen you with Oprah. I've read some of your books. Um, you're a very deep spiritual thinker, and you've entered a milieu that to me, seems the polar opposite <laughs> yeah. of anything having to do with any kind of spiritual quality. So can you talk us through, um, you're reading this book, A Course in Miracles. It inspires you. You start teaching from it in the early 80s. You become a, you know, an AIDS activist in the mid-80s, then kind of a new age, forgive me for using that term, but for lack of a better word. Um, and and how how does that path and you can talk us through that path in a little more detail if you want. How does that path lead you to going into the cesspool of politics? The very fact that contemporary politics is what you uh, describe as a cesspool, the very fact that you would think of contemporary politics as so divergent from what Abraham Lincoln called the angels of our better nature is the problem. This is aberrational. You know, prior to this moment, prior to this sociopathically, economically driven moment, while I can't say, and none of us could accurately say, that America ever totally aligned the better self within us all with our political expression, there was the consensus we were supposed to try. Hmm. The fact that today we just accept that politics is to have nothing to do with that which is good, true, and loving is beyond neurotic. Yeah, it is pathological. Yeah. So the spiritual person, in my mind, doesn't look the other way. That's not transcendence. That's denial about a festering wound that is um, in our midst. So is this what you're trying to do, is to bring the spirituality back into the political discussion? Um a, how do we do that? And B, are you really trying to win this thing or are you just trying to bring this issue out into the mainstream? The answer is yes. I, that is what I'm not only trying to do. I believe it's what I am doing to the best of my ability. And to people who say that this is just to elevate the conversation, I think I've had a career where I, I've been seeking to elevate the conversation. This is too hard <laughs> on every level yeah. to do just to elevate the conversation. That's number one. And number two, we don't have time to do anything less. Those who say it's naive if you think love could be the organizing principle of human civilization as opposed to a soulless economic principle. My perspective is that what is naive is to think that this human race will even survive for another hundred years on this planet if we don't at least try. So how do we bring the peace and love and service components, the spiritual aspects that were there in the 60s and early 70s, how do we inspire young people to maybe consider those as a tool for social change? That's not difficult at all. What's difficult is getting over the obstruction of the political and media elite who would prefer that you not do so. Why? So why do they want us to not do so? Is it because there is, again, enormous 
economic advantage, political and economic advantage, in making sure that the vast majority of the populace stays sort of happy and quiet and, um, you know, uh, docile. And the the last thing that I think either party wants is what you guys were talking about, right? A bunch of uh, people marching through the streets. Spiritually uh, talking about people. Yeah, talking about love can change the world. And, I mean, I don't imagine anyone in the Democratic or Republican Party wants any of that. So is it, again, just a, a means of maintaining uh, – uh, control, and I'm sorry if I'm 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 usually the the sort of more pessimistic one of the two of us. I'm I'm the the usually more the the skeptical one, and I I sometimes feel like that um, so much of our modern politics is about the opposite of uh, rallying people right uh, to a to a cause. That it, it's instead it's about creating a level of hopelessness that makes people just simply tune out. The two of you are acting like there's an inquiry about something that is so freaking obvious yeah. now. Okay, why are we... But like, hello, like, hello. Real democracy is messy. And real democracy is constantly disruptive of the old in order to, to regenerate what is possible. Real democracy is a threat to any level of controlled order. So there's no question here. I think we need to move to the next step, which is what are we going to do about what we all already know now? And I see this on the campaign. And by the way, this goes back to what you were saying. How are you going to wake up young people? I don't. They're so ready. They're so mm-hmm. there. The problem is not where not only young people are. The problem isn't where the American people are. The problem is with a political establishment that treats people like their children. That does not treat to people, talk to people's nobility, does not speak to people's intelligence. And what I find is you speak to people where they're intelligent and they hear you where they're intelligent. So, and another thing I find in my lectures, all in my campaign a lot, I'll say to people after talking about the B-21 Raiders, talking about the millions of traumatized children, talking about defense contractors' dominance of, of um, our national security agenda, whatever it is. And I'll say, I didn't just tell you anything you don't already know. Mm-hmm. And you see people nod their heads. I said, you might not know all the details that I just mentioned, but we already know this. This is not a moment of data collection. This is not a moment of wake up, everybody. This is a moment of what are we going to do about this? Well, okay. So what are we going to do about it? Your answer goes back, I think, to where so much of your um, identity and so much of your career uh, began with the Course in Miracles, this sort of notion that... You can, um, as I think as you put it once, relinquish a thought system based on fear and accept instead a thought system based on love. So, okay, let's talk about the real world problems that we're dealing with in, in the United States. Okay. You, you mentioned a bunch of them. <clears throat> now, let's let's put that in play. Let's, okay. let's replace that fear with love. Okay. All right. So what does fear do? Fear has a $2 trillion tax cut where 83 cents of every dollar – goes to the very richest earners and corporations. And the idea is that a bunch of corporate aristocrats would, because the stockholder value is so increased, that they would be the job creators, um, translate, drop a few crumbs in the form of job creation from their high perch, and then this would lift all boats. All that money would trickle down. It would lift all boats. And, of course, after 40 years, we see that it has not lifted all boats. It has left millions of people without a, even a life vest. What does love do? Love repeals that tax cuts, right? These are not mysterious things. Things. Love is that which serves people. Love is that which helps people. Love is that which serves life and the processes of life and people's capacity to self-actualize. It, it, love removes the shackles that binds people. Love unleashes people's spirit. And how does that translate into politics? Healthcare, free college, get rid of these college loans, make capital available. Feed the 13 million hungry American children. Deal with the chronic economic anxiety of 93 million people living in this country in near poverty. You know, my entire career has not been about love justice theory. My entire career has been about the application of spiritual principles to very practical situations in our lives. All that spirituality is, is the path of the heart. And I come, I'm, I'm Jewish. I come from a tradition 
uh, Tikkun Olam, to repair the world. I come from a tradition where the main Talmudic uh, injunction is you are not obligated to complete the task, but neither are you permitted to abandon it. So uh, I come from an earthy religion. I don't come from a people who are unaware of, of political consequences. And I don't come from a people that separates political consequences from, from our theological identity. So for me, it's the most natural thing in the world. The sufferer in front of you, there is no political or spiritual path anywhere that gives any of us a pass on addressing the suffering of other sentient beings. So this whole idea of spirituality as separate is just this kind of neo-capitalist um, uh, fantasy that has arisen in the last few decades. Uh, so some people could sell more online courses. It has absolutely nothing to do with the great religious and spiritual traditions of the world as you mm -hmm. so... So eloquently have articulated for the world. So I recently did a post on my Facebook page about a documentary on HBO. Now, I stupidly can't remember the name of it, but it was essentially about people without a citizenship status and what their lives are like in the U.S. And, you know, I posted about it, said this is looks really amazing, really excited to see this. And I got, you know, two or three like, oh, this looks good. And I got about, you know, 37 comments of like, because it, it featured a story of a Guatemalan mother bringing her daughter to the border and them being separated. I got 37 comments about, like, she should never have brought her daughter. What a terrible mother she is. Well, if she's trying to break the law, the law says you have to apply for citizenship. Like, and all of these kind of, like, honestly, Fox News talking points that just are so far removed from just really basic um, um, empathy and civility um, how do, and and these I, I'm assuming because they all looked kind of like angry middle-aged white male from mid America, and I don't want to judge an entire population. But Although you just how, did. how do we? That's what they look like in their Twitter handles. <laughs> that's yeah, that's their little their little. I looked at their little profile pictures, but how do we repair that? Because okay, so this is the deal: when we passed the Civil Rights Act in 1964. Haters and segregationists did still exist. Mm -hmm. Politics is never about 100% of your population moving in a certain direction. So this is why I believe that— You're tipping the balance. You're trying to— That's what elections are. It's, mm -hmm. about, it's not about winning all the votes. It's about winning more of the votes. So let's—and this is why I feel very strongly about how we as Americans need to revisit our history. So in 1776, you had this group of men— who risked their lives. They risked their lives to sign that document because if the British had won the war, then they would have been executed as traitors. And this document has the most enlightened aspirational principles that have ever formed the core of a nation, that all are created equal, that God gave all men inalienable rights of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness, that governments are instituted to secure those rights, and that it is the right of the people, if the government is not doing its job, to to alter or abolish it. Enlightened, aspirational, creating a possibility, a space of possibility for the human race that literally had never occurred before. That's where it starts. But that's also where it got gnarly. Because out of the 56 signers, 41 of them were slave owners. Mm. So that characterological dichotomy has always been with us. It is built into the cake. It is built into the DNA of the American psyche. We are at once both the most enlightened aspirational uh, ideal mm -hmm. and we have been from the beginning. Mm -hmm. It has never not been true. Every generation has played out this dichotomy. From the beginning, we have at times been the most violent perpetrators of transgression against those principles. Now, every generation simply writes its story. Which are you going to be? So you have slavery, but then a generation rose up, and they were abolitionists. We had suppression of women. Generation rose up. We had women's suffrage. A generation was uh, institutionalized white uh, supremacy in the South and segregation. A generation rose up and civil rights. You can't be so precious about the people that don't agree with you. 
It, mm-hmm. it can't be. Of course they exist. It just seems so magnified now. And unfortunately, in many ways, it is so magnified now because, number one, social media. And number two, and this is where we really have a problem on our hands, obviously, we have a person, mm-hmm. no less power than the presidency of the United States, who is not above harnessing uh, those forces and exploiting them for his own political gain. But at a certain point, so they don't agree with you. So, psh, you know, what FDR used to say, I welcome their hatred. You think Martin Luther King didn't get hate mail? <laughs> you know, you and I, we have become such a, a lightweight generation. We are so precious. Other generations, they were shooting at them. We have, like, mean tweets, and we can't take it. <laughs> it's true. I think about those early civil rights workers. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, People that... say they're so traumatized by what's going on. Yeah. And like, I, I'm just so traumatized by Trump. And I'm like, we don't have time for you to get over your trauma work before you show up for Mm. your country. You think those people walking across the bridge at Selma weren't traumatized? Yeah. They didn't know if they were going to send out the dogs, the the hoses, or even the The bullets. The National Guard, yeah. Right. Yeah. And these volunteers came down from the north from all over the place, black and white, every race, Jewish, uh, had had a great history of civil rights involvement. And there was no social media. They weren't Instagramming their sleeping on the floor, sleeping on a cot and eating cold spaghetti dinners, spending months and months and months on the front lines. (laughs) And some of them were killed. Let's not forget they were murdered. Yeah. Can we go back a little bit? Let's let's talk about how this journey started for you. We talked a little bit about um, this text, A Course in Miracles, um, which presents itself as a kind of spiritual psychotherapy. I'd love to, first of all, understand what that means to you. What, what What is spiritual psychotherapy? There's a line in The Course of Miracles which says, at their peak, religion and psychotherapy are the same thing because they're a healing of the mind. So I think of a, of a genuine spiritual counselor, even a genuine clergy, as a mental health professional mm. in a way because the spirit is the mind. It's the, mm-hmm. it's the mind of love. So the search for the mind of love in a world that is dominated by thoughts of fear is the spiritual path, is the journey of enlightenment. Light means understanding. And we live in a world, according to the Course in Miracles, and I think according to a lot of um, serious spiritual source materials, because the Course doesn't claim any monopoly on truth. It's based on universal spiritual themes. The idea that the world in which we live is dominated by a thought system that is false, a thought system of fear, a thought system that is based on the perception of the physical self. So my physical eyes tell me you're over there. But the spiritual perspective says, well, actually, time and space themselves are part of the illusion of consciousness, Mm -hmm. as Einstein would say. And there's really no place on the level of your spirits where you stop and I start. So those are like two parallel universes. If I base my perception of myself, if I base my perception of you, and I base my perception of what I am to do in the world, only on the first which is the, the uh, perceptions of my physical body, what my eyes see, what my ears hear, etc. It's, it's an unwise guidance system. It, it, it doesn't guide me to right action, and it doesn't guide me to happiness. So the spiritual journey is honing your attitudinal muscles. So whereas the world might say, um, Rain ha- is doing this podcast, and... Um, Risa is doing this podcast, and you, Marianne, are uh, running for president, and so they have you as a guest today. Now, there's one way of looking at it, which is just above the waterline, which is everything I just described. It's very shallow and ultimately meaningless. It doesn't take us anywhere. And then there's all that underneath, which is what you really want in your life and what you really want in your life, what I really want in my life and what everybody listening really wants and how really we're all drawn here, just like like cells are, uh, you know, two two little cells become a brain and two little cells end up becoming an entire body. The cells of life are such that we all ended up here because there is a maximal learning opportunity for everyone where, if you wish, your highest gifts, your highest gifts and my highest gifts can co-create for something much more meaningful and important. Now, 
Which one of those two, I think it is, determines who I am in this room? Determines my energy, determines what I say, determines my experience, determines yours because on, you guys have the same thing going on. It's just which, which world do you choose to live in? It's funny. I've, I, the kind of language that you just used, I've heard a lot um, when it comes to integrative medicine. You know, people talk a lot about the same thing. body, mind. So it seems like what you're doing now is taking that idea and creating an integrative politics. So how does that work? How does, how does mind, spirit, uh, interaction work when it comes to the realm of politics? And I don't mean policy. Right. I, I think you make perfect sense that, you know, you know a, a policy that's, that is based in love is a policy in which all human beings have their humanity dignified. Well, make and peace rather than war. Right. Stunning that's concept. Obvious. But I mean specifically in the gritty day-to-day of politics. How, how do you have an integrative politics? Well— We were talking earlier about how American civilization is not the problem. The American people are not the problem. And one of the examples of the fact that the American people are doing just fine, thank you, is the kind of revolution in thinking that has occurred in medicine. We are no longer stuck in the old allopathic model. We no longer look at medicine through the lens of Newtonian, a Newtonian science, where the world is just a machine and you just tweak the pieces of the machine. Right. Rather, integrative medicine understands that there is more going on here than just the external symptom. And so you don't not take care of your body and just, if you get sick, hope to allopathically, through some external remedy, eradicate or suppress the symptom. You know you have to cultivate health. You know that you have to uh, t- take care of many aspects of the self. And that is true in every area of life in America, that we're at least on the move there. We're trending to a more holistic whole person integrated perspective, except politics, right. which is stuck in this 20th century Newtonian mechanistic perspective where the, as far as – as deep as the conversation goes is external symptoms. And so all conversation about shift in policy is based on this very superficial treatment only of symptoms without any deeper inquiry as to cause. And that's why I'm running because I believe that a 21st century, a genuine, a real president for the 21st century, in order to help heal this country and lead this country to where we should be, needs to have a far more integrative understanding, not only of how to treat our problems, but where our problems come from to begin with and what the deeper human experience is that leads to both um, the societal pathologies as well as societal repair. So one thing that we've talked about on this podcast before and Reza and I have had debates about is like, I believe that our political system is just broken, just absolutely broken from the top to the bottom. The entire way that it's structured, the the two party system, um, the fundraising system, um, the the way you have to kowtow to the DNC or the RNC or or whatever. Uh, I mean, here's one fact. Um Next presidential election is estimated that they will spend $6 billion just on media buys. $6 billion. Think of the problems in the world that we could solve with $6 billion. But I view this as so entirely broken. Aren't you, aren't you just exacerbating the problem by, by taking part in a broken system? Is there an, isn't there some other kind of system Uh, or some kind of initiating a spiritual revolution separate from this broken partisan, you know, money political system? The spiritual revolution uh, is already happening. When you say our political system is broken, and then the first thing you mentioned was the political parties, our constitution does not mention political parties. And George Washington warned us against them. He said that it would just create factions of men who cared more about their their faction than about their country. So I make a distinction between our political system and this aberrational, sick modern politics that you just described. If you say, just let it be what it is, and I say this with all deep respect, but that's easy for, for, for us to say, because we're not the ones 
living with the terrible, terrible consequences of this system gone amok. So it's kind of a white privilege thing thank to you. say. I, thank you. For, I'll, say, I didn't I'll say, label but, myself. Yeah, sure. Absolutely what it is. So, <clears throat> so I believe that it's not exacerbating the problem. I think what we need is more of us to say this has got to stop. I, I wonder, you know, this is a very interesting question because I, I think it's, it's a question that's not a, just about you or this time, but it's a question that is asked, I think, of all uh, spiritual leaders, which is, do you engage with the world or do you divorce yourself from the world? You know, is the world corrupt and will it just end up corrupting you? Or um, is the is the proper way to just simply uh, separate yourself and to to disengage and to create, you know, a, a new society from the ground up? And you, you're very clearly in the former camp, very clearly saying, I'm going to engage. I'm going to jump in the pig pig slime and and I'm, I'm going to fight with them. No? No, it's not that simple at all. During the best of times, I'm very happy in the position of spiritual leader where you hover just far enough above the ground, enough to know what's going on in order to be the conscience of a society, mm. but your main function is to hold aloft the ideal. It's just that there are times... Look at someone like Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Mm. Well, before Hitler... He, he was a minister. Yeah. He was a theologian. He didn't want that. It, it has to do with the times in which you live, right? I'm sure you feel that uh, yourself. I mean, you and I both uh, come from, uh, from areas which it, 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 of white uh, ivory tower in the best of sense. Mm -hmm. But the times in which we live, what might be okay in one decade, you know, is a cop-out in another decade. Yeah, That's I how I look at it. So if if Trump had not become president, I, I'm sure I would not be doing this. But Trump is president. And I don't believe that the spiritual path is one in which you, you know, there's, there's a saying that people use in terms of personal transformation, spiritual bypass. You can't do a spiritual bypass, <laughs> just pour pink pain over stuff and pretend it's okay when it's not okay. You heal in life through a kind of detox as things have to be brought to the surface, looked at, dealt with, processed, atoned for, made amends for, the better self reclaimed, and then you can change. And that is as true of a of a nation as it is of as of an individual, because a uh, country is just a group of people. What I what I love about the way that you have talked about Trump is. Um, you do kind of see him in this bizarre way as a kind of spiritual leader. He has he is someone who has tapped into a kind of dark undercurrent um, that has always existed, not just in this country, but among human beings. You look at these rallies in which he is openly mocking disabled people or mocking women who've been raped or, um, you know. Mocking uh, Greta Thunberg. Yeah. Who's mocking, making a stand about climate change. Mocking children. Yeah. Who's on, and the way in which that rally um, explodes in laughter and adulation for him. I've written a lot of. Uh, about this, about how Trump is a cult leader, that he is uh, fundamentally leading a uh, a kind of death cult, a religious cult. You know, we have had good presidents and bad presidents. We have had presidents who have pursued good policy and bad policy. You can't really put Trump in those categories. Uh, his actions, his thoughts, his words, his very being exude Let's use the word fear. So he is a kind of guru. He's a he's a f guru of fear and hate. So why are we making fun about the notion that maybe the way to confront this guy is not with a better policy? That thirty percent doesn't give a shit about be better policy. They are they are finding joy and happiness in the suffering and dehumanization of other people. Um, taxes aren't what's at stake. Maybe what we do need is. The opposite pole, like a Jedi. We need a Jedi Knight, right? Only a Jedi Knight can defeat a Sith Lord. <laughs> so, you just um, you just raised your arms. Why I believe that I'm the person who should be the nominee. He is certainly not a spiritual leader, but I certainly agree with you. He is a cult leader, mm. and he is dealing with the darkest forces by which fear literally has the power to dismantle reason. And you are absolutely right to think that you can just come at that with intellectual argument and emotional persuasion based on traditional 20th century politics is like saying I will sharpen my knives knowing 
knowing that they are coming at me with very big right. guns. Yeah. So the idea should not be laughed at. That we're talking about. Yeah. This man has ushered in an era of political theater, and we will not be going back. He is not just a politician. He is a phenomenon, and we need to create a phenomenon of our own. The issue is, whereas fear harness for those kinds of cult-like purposes can dismantle reason, the only thing that can dismantle the fear is love, the human capacity to love. So the idea that someone brings the skill set to inspire love and to motivate love. Oh, let's put that down. People say all she can do is motivate, she inspires. And I, I think to myself, yeah, mm. you might want to think about that. But Obama ran on hope, which is well, similar, is connected hello, to love. he won. Yeah, but I got to say, there is a difference. Hope, hope in a sense is undefinable, right? It's basically like, vote for me. And, it's very unspecific. And, yeah, together we can perhaps do the things that we, we want to do in order to have a better world. When someone says, I think we can defeat Trump with love, yeah, I, I listen, I'm until this moment where I really suddenly realized that Trump is a Sith Lord and you might be a Jedi Knight, um, before that moment, yeah, I was part of the group that would say, yeah, no, you, you're not going to defeat this guy You know this what it reminds me of? That's just ridiculous. It reminds me of the Blue Meanies from the Yellow Submarine. <laughs> yeah, the Blue remember? Meanies. I yeah, the Blue Meanies, and then we'll defeat them with love. And uh... Dave Navarro said, if he's a warlock, why not a sorceress? <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> just to ask a purely political question, is there a candidate uh, that you feel is closest to the kind of vision that you are representing as a, as a candidate for president? Economically, Bernie and Elizabeth, in terms of calling out the military-industrial complex, Tulsi. However, if you just just disrupting economics is not enough and yeah. just talking about um, the war machine is I'm, not enough. I meant more in terms of integrative politics. No, um, I meant. No, that's it. No, no one's thinking that way. You're the love candidate. <laughs> well, but I, I think that, and, I, and one of the reasons I appreciate this conversation is that's not nothing. That is not nothing. So, we do a little thing we call a lightning round of life's big questions. We're going to toss some uh, some big, big-ass questions your way, and we'd love uh, a quick, instinctive answer. When do, when do you feel most connected to the universe? When I'm with someone I love. What makes you laugh out loud? When someone I love tickles me. <laughs> what is your biggest fear? A scary death. And on that note, <laughs> what would you like your final meal to be? Oh, I don't care. <laughs> what do you think is... By the, the way, I just want to make, uh, make it very clear. Death itself does not scare me. It's not it's death scary that death. scares yeah, me. It's, yeah. like, it's, it's like the Woody it's Allen, like, I just don't want to be there when it happens. It's like flesh eating that bacteria <laughs> on your face or yeah, something like that. Yeah, there are certain ways it. that nobody, you know, nobody yeah. wants to go Who wants to go ways, that way, yeah. yeah. So what do you think is the purpose of your life? To love. What's one thing that you know for sure? How much I love my daughter. Describe your soul in ten words or less. Struggling as does every other soul to break through the walls of the worldly container that sometimes would limit its expression. That was more than ten words. I'm sorry. I'm gonna go. I gotta pull the plug on this podcast. I don't know. Was it? I'm not sure. I, I wasn't. I was I gotta be honest. I wasn't counting. I was like fourteen at least. Oh man, you just lost my vote. <laughs> and then finally, damn, I tried so hard. Yeah. Finally, what is your life's big question? I find certain aspects of love mysterious, intimate love. That's a place where I still have questions that remain in the realm of mystery to me. Mm. That's beautiful. Well, Marianne Williamson, thank you so much for joining us, and good luck out there on the road. Thank you. It's, it's an a honor tough to be with road. you guys. Thank you so much. And listen, I you know I always feel like anyone 
who is willing to go through uh, the shit storm that is a, a presidential campaign uh, deserves an enormous amount of respect. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. So Reza, in this newfound duo of you and I being podcast hosts, you are typically the more skeptical one, which is weird that I'm kind of like the, the airy-fairy, like that is weird. feeling one, which is crazy. But um, did you hear anything? Did you hear anything that might have changed your heart a little bit? Do you think that love or hope uh, can be effective in beating tyranny. Where do you stand after hearing her platform? I'll tell you what. There was one thing that she said that I think really got my attention. I think she speaks about Trump the right way. You know, in politics right now, there's this division ab- about, uh, especially certainly among the Democratic candidates, about what Trump represents. The Biden view is that, oh, he's just an aberration. He's just a blip. Right. He's just that once we get rid of him, then everybody will go back to normal. The Republicans will be rational again and everything will be fine. Then there's the other view, which is, no, he is the symptom of a larger problem. Right. And you could get rid of Trump, but you're never going to get rid of the problem itself unless you begin to address it. What I hear Marianne saying is something different, which is that Trump is the physical embodiment of evil and death and corruption that, yes, he didn't come out of nowhere, that he kind of grew out of the, the cesspool of everything that is awful um, in this country. Well, I would now I'm going to jump in because I'm going to say, I don't know. I don't know that she said evil, but I do think that she I said, think I he said is, evil. He is. <laughs> yes, I think that was your own bias coming in there. But I do think that she was saying that he is the physical embodiment of a deep spiritual disease that our nation is in right now. And that by focusing on a platform of love and healing and compassion, that we need to kind of address the roots of that disease rather than necessarily just a bunch of specific economic policies. Right. But she also did say that his presence on this stage means that nothing will be the same again. Mm-hmm. And I say that all the time. Yep. Like there is no there is no U-turn here. This is now the path we're on. The path we're on is the path in which the most powerful man on earth can be a soulless scumbag uh, who has raped multiple women. Um, like that is a real thing. And I, and I think that if her argument is, you know, let's treat this like a spiritual fight. Let's not treat it like a political fight. Let's, if, if you are the kind of person who believes in good and evil, and I am, and you look at this man and you see him as the embodiment of what I'm going to call evil— then how? what would you do about that if this were a spiritual battle and not just a question of policies? Honestly, this was the first time that I've ever really given her message um, some serious thought because, yeah, I'm, I'm still not going to vote for Marianne Williamson, to be honest with you. I like her, but I'm not going to vote for her. But I do think there's something about what she's saying. She sees the world in spiritual terms. And I like to think that I do too. And so if you see the world in spiritual terms, how do you explain this scar on humanity that is this orange monster except in spiritual terms? And so, you know, how do you defeat evil? You defeat it with good. How do you defeat hatred? You defeat it with love. Suddenly, it doesn't feel like platitudes anymore. But I think, you know, uh, certainly we need to get a better leader in in there. So that's as much <laughs> politics as I'll, as I'll cover. <laughs> that's, but that is the that, most political that, I've ever heard you yeah, ever. So certainly that's true. And I but I do think that for the political left that's where all the focus is going and I understand that. But there there is a larger disease. There is a larger imbalance in America right now that is truly truly scary. And it's based on fear and it's based on blame and it's based on hating the other. And um, those those issues we we have to deal with in a in a with a much 
broader lens, a wider lens, and a much deeper probing conversation, there's a cancer under there that's not going to be solved simply by getting a new president in, in my mind. So, listeners, this is a, a twofold question that we're going to leave you with. Number one, very specifically, did your view on Marianne Williamson change mm-hmm. a little bit like my view on her did? And number two, oh, Jesus, I mean, you've been engaged in this never-ending election season for like 13 years now, I think it's been going yep. on, 13, yep. 14 years. Uh, what do you think? About this idea of love and spirituality and politics. Can they exist? Do they have a place in politics? Can you bring in love and spirituality? I don't know. I still don't know, really, Reza. Yeah. I still don't know. You can find us on social at Reza Aslan and at Rain Wilson, of course. Hashtag metaphysical. You can email us metaphysicalmilkshake at soulpancake.com. How do you think we can transform our political system? Is love all you need? I do know how we can transform the podcast system. <gasps> tell me. Luminary Media. Oh, I thought you were so, going to say love. No. Fuck love. So tell all your pod loving friends, make them download the app, and of course, subscribe to Metaphysical Milkshake. And if they don't, Trump wins. That's right. Thank you again to our guest today, Marianne Williamson. And uh, good luck out there, people. Thanks so much for listening. This has been Metaphysical Milkshake, presented by Luminary Media and Soul Pancake. Metaphysical Milkshake is executive produced by Rain Wilson, Reza Aslan, Golriz Lucina, and Daryush Brzwella Nothaft of Soul Pancake. Hashem Self is the head of production. Metaphysical Milkshake is produced by Amy S. Choi and Rebecca Lehrer of The Mashup Americans. Associate producers are Jocelyn Gonzalez, Lindsay Cradwell, Sarah Pellegrini, Mary Phillips Sandy, and Shelby Sandlin. Original music by Jeff Tang and Scott Tang. He doesn't even turn away from the mic, I'm, though. I'm That's moving a, away. I'm like, you're so just like, far away. Just from like, it. like, like, like you, you, have a, you have here. a swivel chair and just like go like this. Oh.